We welcome our Rejoice worshipers this morning to the proclamation of the Word. The second lesson is from Luke 16. Um, And thank you for the setup, Laura, on this parable. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is it that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. And the manager said to him, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Meet us where we are this day, O God, and lift us into your presence. Open our hearts. Open our eyes to you. Amen. A high school student comes home to his parents with failing grades. The mother is beside herself and tells her son that if he doesn't bring up his grades, he will be uh, grounded for the entire next semester. The father His warnings of punishment are even more severe. So, the son has a clever idea. He goes to the smartest people in his class, and he makes a deal. If they will write uh, the required papers and the essays for him, if they will let him copy their homework and allow him to sit beside them at test time, wink, wink, he in turn will do certain favors for them, such as uh, paying them. So a deal is struck. And at the end of the semester, the boy comes home to his parents with a glowing, I mean a glowing report card. And when they ask him how he has achieved this dramatic improvement, He tells them how by being dishonest and uh, the shady deals that he's had with his classmates. And how do his parents respond? By commending their son for being so resourceful, so clever, so smart, so astute. What do you think? Well, that's pretty much the way the story goes that Jesus tells, right? The parable. A rich man is unhappy with his manager because he thinks the manager is wasting his money. So he calls him in, wants an accounting of his work, and tells him that he's soon going to be fired. The manager then goes to the people who owe uh, his boss the money, and he offers them a deal. Instead of paying... uh, A hundred barrels of olive oil, he says, okay, you'll just pay 50. Instead of paying uh, for 
100 bushels of wheat, okay, you'll just pay 80. Now, when the rich employer discovers the sleazy dealings of his soon-to-be-fired employee, he praises him for being smart, clever, astute, shrewd. And then he says, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their generation than are the people of light. That's us, the people of light. Now, the, the marvel of the parables is in their ability to astound us, to wake us up, to surprise us. And just like those first century hearers, uh, we often receive an unexpected ending, a bizarre twist in these parables Jesus tells. I mean, Jesus was a master storyteller, and he often used hyperbole uh, to make a point. And that, this parable certainly has that. But I don't know about you, but I have a real problem with this parable. I mean, a real problem. I mean, Jesus makes an unethical, scheming, sleazy uh, manager the hero of the story. And with our sense of justice about about things, it just doesn't seem right that this sleazy manager is uh, commended, commended and praised for the, for the way he's worked this out by basically cheating his employer and by cutting ethical deals, unethical deals with, uh, uh, with his clients. I mean, this manager could be the poster child for those who think and believe that the ends justify the means. That it doesn't really matter how you reach the goal. No, what's important is that you reach it, regardless of how you get there. What bothers me, and what I suspect bothers you, is that uh, from everything else we know in the gospel about Jesus, Jesus would never, Jesus would never uh, commend uh, such behavior. He would never condone such behavior. I mean, everything we know about Jesus means that the means, the means are as important as the ends, right? So we have to back off and think about this. So what is going on in this story where the, where the manager turns out to be the hero of the story. And what is going on is that sometimes Jesus tells parables that are not allegories. Okay? You know, what, you know about an allegory. Allegories are stories where each character in, in the story represents someone or something. Uh, often in the parables of Jesus, represent God or uh, the church, or the Jews, or the Sadducees, or the Pharisees, or lost people. For instance, I mean, we're all very familiar with the parable of the prodigal son, right? That's an allegory. We know that the father represents God, who is loving and forgiving. That the younger son, who was lost and squandered his inheritance, uh, represents the, the spiritually lost. And that the older son in the parable, who can't, uh, who can't forgive and celebrate his brother when he's returned, or can't uh, celebrate along with his father that his younger brother has returned, you know, represents those times when we are just so resentful and self-righteous that we can't see God. That's an allegory, right? But sometimes Jesus' parables are not allegories. Uh, rather, he tells these stories in order to make a particular point, which is, which is the case here. Jesus would never condone or promote unethical, sleazy, uh, deceitful behavior. So what's his point? His point comes at the very end of the story where Jesus uses the Greek word 
phronimos. Okay, listen to verse 8. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted phronimos. For the children of this age are more phronimos in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. So what's the translation? What is phronimos? Clever, wise, shrewd, smart, astute. Uh, Which is to say, Jesus observes much shrewd, wise, smart, clever thinking out in the world, but he does not see the same smart, clever, astute thinking going on with the children of light. That's us. That's the people of God. Jesus is urging his followers to be more phronimos, astute, clever, smart, wise, not in an unethical way, but about the things that are really important, the things that are described in uh, in God's kingdom that Jesus is always raising up as the most important. I mean, Jesus sees how, how smart and wise people can be when they want to be. And of course, that's right. I mean, you and I, we know how to get along in the world, don't we? We learn how to turn things to our advantage, our handling of money, how we run our home, how we run our business, how to throw a successful party, how to dress smartly uh, to impress, how to chair a committee to get something done. And if we don't know how, we learn how. I mean, if it's important to us, if it's important to us, we become wise, clever, smart. We learn how to succeed in what we think is important, right? But will we be so clever, so wise, so smart in succeeding in the things that really matter? That's what Jesus is asking here. For instance, when we we baptize our children, it it reminds us that as parents, uh, we have this incredible, this awesome task of not just raising our children, but raising them in a certain way. In our minds, uh, we know what kind of people we want our children uh, to become, right? Right? And either formally or informally, we have a plan. We have a vision for for this, for for directing our children into the future. We are phronimos. We are astute, clever, sharp, smart uh, in our thinking, in our planning, in our acting, right? I mean, we start college funds. Uh, We help them socialize uh, with playmates and parties and uh, weekday schools. We help them learn to read and count and reason. We choose schools that we believe are best for their education. We put them in gymnastics or, or swimming or music or, or in some athletic uh, ventures that we think are good for them, is good for their, good for their development. We take parenting classes. We read... Uh, Uh, books on child rearing. We listen to uh, child psychologists, right? I mean, we are so frontimous, astute, clever, wise, because we know how important it is to get our children prepared for this thing called the world and living in it. And the question Jesus asked is, will we be as frontimous smart, clever, wise, shrewd in thinking, planning, and acting on the things that are important. Or in this case, we're just talking about with children would be developing our children's spiritual life, right? Or we could just leave it to chance. In the same way that uh, we would say, if she wants to take dancing, fine. If she doesn't want to, uh, that's fine too. 
uh, which translate, eh, if my child decides that God's important, then I'm okay with that. But I'm not going to push my religion on them. Really? I mean, do you see what I'm talking about here? We are smart and astute in the things that we know and think and believe are important. Is the faith of our children important? Not just now, but for the decades ahead. I mean, we can ask the same question about our own lives. Is faith, is, uh, is following Jesus important enough to be frontmost in the way we approach it? Um, are we astute? Are we clever about, about developing our own spiritual life, about uh, developing uh, a generous heart, a life that gives, a life that serves, that reflects the ways of Jesus? Or will we just let be what will be? and follow an unastute, meandering path where we just uh, meander through life with no intent, with no intention about growing deeper in this relationship that we have with God. Being smart, astute in the things that really matter that's what Jesus intends here. It's not just a question about parenting or about our own spiritual development. I mean, I think about this as a question uh, for the church, uh, for, for the body of Christ, for, for First Presbyterian. Are we astute? Are we clever? Are we smart in how we go about being the body of Christ? Is our mission clear? Is our vision for who we want to be, is it clear? Is it uh, an astute, do we have an astute way to go about uh, accomplishing our purpose as the people of God? Or will we just let happen what will happen? So Jesus says, the people of this world are more Phronimos, clever, smart, wise, shrewd, in handling their generation than are the people of light. That's us. So I read a lawsuit. I read about a lawsuit. This was some time ago uh, that was filed against a local church. Bad idea, by the way. And one of the, one of the worshipers was hurt, was bumped over somehow, fell, and... Uh, and so she sued the church, saying that the church was, was liable. Uh, but this is what struck me about the case. The church's attorney, arguing that the church was not responsible, said this. A church is a nonprofit organization, manned for the most part by volunteers. No one has a right to expect it to be run with the smart efficiency of a business. Therefore, the plaintiff has no real claim. Let me repeat that. No one has a right to expect the church to be run with the smart efficiency of a business. I find that insulting. Really? I believe Jesus would beg to differ. Jesus expects the people of light, the church, to be run with a smart wisdom as if we were running a business of some kind. But the church is not a business, of course. We don't have a bottom line of, of, of making a profit or trying to return uh, a financial investment for our stakeholders or stockholders. When people have said, and I've heard it said a lot, well, the church should be run like a business. Well, I say, yeah, and no. No, in that uh, we have a different ethos, right, and how we operate. I mean, we are the church. We have operating principles that are rooted in our theological principles, in the way of Jesus. Or we cease to be the church. 
For us, uh, the means are just as important as the ends. And yes, yes, the church should be run like a business. When we incorporate good, sound financial uh, principles and operating principles. And yes, uh, we learn not only from business, but uh, from organizations, from nonprofits, from educational institutions, from the behavioral sciences that teach us uh, leadership, management, uh, development uh, principles. Our bottom line is not profit, our bottom line is mission. Uh, for a long time, we've been saying at First Presbyterian, we're a church of growing disciples. That phrase points to our mission. We want to grow and to develop spiritually. We want to cultivate a deeper faith and be able to express that faith in the world by making the world better, making the world more compassionate and caring. And our task is to think, to plan, to act smartly, as smartly as if we were, we were running a business and accomplishing our purpose. So one of the questions that I ask, that we ask, we have to ask is, do we think, do we think our mission is as important as the people at Google think their mission is? Do we? Do we think our mission is as important as those at Cone Hospital think their mission is? Do we? Do we think our mission is as important as uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal or Fidelity Investments or you name it, whatever? Do we think our mission is as important as they think their mission is? Are we as passionate about uh, accomplishing this mission. And as frontalmost, as smart, astute, clever, wise, shrewd in accomplishing this mission. So here's my takeaway from the parable. We need to be smart and clever as the people of God in the things that really matter, such as uh, developing the spiritual life of our children, developing our own spiritual life, developing a servant's heart that reflects the ways of Jesus so we can make a difference in the world. And we need to be smart and clever in being the church because no one, no one has a more important mission than you and I do as the body of Christ.